here and of course that means grade sevens that it is time for natural sciences. Now I remember at the moment we are exploring elements and how they're classified in the periodic table. So today we're going to focus on the names and the symbols of the elements in the periodic table. So let's begin. Remember in our last lesson, we saw the periodic table for the very first time. And we learned that there are colors on the periodic table to help us understand the different properties of the elements. We also learned a lot about, or we learned that there are numbers on the periodic table, and we're going to explore those numbers in another lesson. Today, we're focusing on the letters in the periodic table. So we can see that there are letters and those letters stand for the names of the different chemicals or the different elements. Each block has its own letters associated with it and those letters mean something. So let's explore. Everyone has a name. And not only do you have a name, you also have initials that stand for the first letters of your names. So, for example, my name is Helen and my surname is David. So I have a name and I have initials that stand for my name. Now, you will have a name and you will have a surname. So you can work out what your initials are that stand for the letters of your names. And in the same way, elements have their names. Oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, sodium. These are some of the names of the elements that we have mentioned previously. So each element has a name but it also has a chemical symbol, very much like your initials, that represent the element. So when we talk about a symbol, we mean something that stands for something else or represents something else. So a clock, for example, can be a symbol of time. My initials stand as a symbol for my full name. And so we find that elements have both a name and a symbol that represents the elements. And the symbol helps us to make sure that everybody's name for that particular element is understood. So we find that the symbol is what we call universal. No matter what language we are talking about to describe the elements or to name the elements, the symbols are universal across languages. So let's explore an example of a name and the chemical symbol of an element. So this particular element that we're talking about is the element that we know in English as iron. If we were talking Isizulu, we would call it Nsembi. If we were talking Afrikaans, we would refer to it as Aster. If I was talking in German, I would refer to it as Eisen. And if I was talking in another language from up north in Africa, if I was talking in Swahili, I would call it Chuma. So we can see that different countries and different languages would refer to what we in English refer to as iron using all of these different names. So it could be quite confusing to scientists, if we were now sitting at a scientific conference about iron and we were using all of these different common names for the same element. So in the periodic table, 
what we do is we have a universal symbol for that particular substance. So the element iron has a symbol Fe. And where does that Fe come from? Well, it comes from the Latin word for iron, which is ferrum. So the first two letters of the Latin name are used as the symbol for iron. It does make it a little bit confusing for you, but can you see that we have a problem when we have so many languages talking about the identical substance? Our periodic table makes sure that it crosses all language barriers by giving a universal symbol to that particular element. All right, so now we start to understand that our elements have names and of course they're going to have names in all different languages, but they all have universal symbols that no matter what language we're speaking, we can identify the element from its symbol. So sometimes we can actually recognize the name of the element from its symbol. So the name is very similar to the English word for that element. But sometimes it can be very hard to recognize the name from the symbol. So here's a case where we have the symbol and the name and we can see in the case of calcium that the symbol was derived from the first two letters of calcium. In the same way, we've got chlorine, and although we've got the first and the third letter in chlorine, Cl kind of makes sense for chlorine. We've got O for oxygen and N for nitrogen. That's very, very straightforward. But there's a problem. We can't use the letter O by itself for any other element. We would have to use O and a small letter. We can't use N for any other element. We would have to make a different symbol. So for example, there is a substance, an element called neon. We can't use N for neon because N is the symbol for nitrogen. So we've got to find a different symbol and neon is NE on the periodic table. All of those examples are fairly simple to understand how the symbol came from the name. But what about these strange symbols? What do they stand for? When we start learning about the periodic table, you'll learn that AU is the symbol for gold. And we can see that it's not, gold is not GO on the periodic table. So we know then that the Latin name for gold has been used to give us an international or universal symbol. Here is one that you've learned about and we've spoken about over the last few weeks quite often, and that is sodium. So we haven't used the letters SO to stand for sodium. Once again, sodium is named after the Latin name for sodium, which is in fact natrium. So natrium, we take the first two letters of natrium and we have our symbol for sodium, Ag, that is our symbol for silver. Pb is our symbol for lead, for example. Now, I wish, grade sevens, that I could give you a nice, easy way of remembering all of these strange symbols that match up to common names of the elements that we don't have in our language in English. So we're not referring to a substance as natrium, we refer to it as sodium, but we have to remember that the symbol is Na. There is no easy way of doing this. This is one of those 
things about science that you've just got to take a deep breath and learn it. But luckily for you, in grade seven, we only ask you to learn 20 of the elements and we're not too strict about it in grade seven. When you move into high school, you have to learn the names of a, a large number of the elements and you have to remember their symbols and even their atomic numbers, which we'll get to in our next lesson. So let's take it just gently. And, and start slowly in grade seven, becoming familiar with these names and understanding where the names come from. Now, in science, you will discover that there are lots of rules for the way we write certain things. We need to understand that we can't break those rules, that sometimes we have to change our style of handwriting in order to follow the rules of science, because if we break those rules of science, we are not going to be understood by other scientists. So there are rules associated with how we write the symbols for the elements on the periodic table, and you have to follow the rules. So let's learn some of those rules. Some symbols for element names are written as a single capital letter. So B, single capital letter, stands for boron. C is one that you should now start learning off by heart. C stands for carbon. N is another one that you should know off by heart now. N stands for nitrogen. And O stands for oxygen. So today you've learned boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Why don't you try and close your eyes and say it with me and then say it the second time without me helping you. So close your eyes, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Boron, then came carbon, then came nitrogen, then came oxygen. All right, so it's not that difficult when I'm telling you, you've got to remember some of the chemical names and their symbols. Some of them are going to be quite simple. Now, some of the symbols for element names are written by a capital letter followed by a single small letter or lowercase letter. Now, let's use the example here of carbon. We've already used up the capital C for carbon, but we have other chemical elements that also start with a C. So we have calcium for example, we have something called cesium. We have something called chlorine. So in these cases, once the C has already been allocated to a particular element, we have to choose a second letter. And the second letter must always be written, here's the rule, as a lowercase. So for example, AL. AL, capital A, small letter L, stands for aluminium. And you're familiar with aluminium. You've used aluminium in your kitchen with tin foil. So that substance, that element, aluminium, is written as capital A, small L. You know that one now too. SI stands for Silicon. Now, silicon is a very important and an extremely common element in the world. All the sand that you walk on is a compound made up of silicon and other substances, other elements. So, silicon is written SI. Why can't we just call silicon S? Well, we can't because the S is already taken by sulfur. So 
S stands for sulfur, but SI stands for silicon. HE stands for helium. And we can't use H because H, as you've seen already, belongs to hydrogen. So I think you can see the pattern and the way that this is being organized and the rules associated with it. Capital letter followed by a lowercase letter. And we have to print them. So we can't write a C like that or a fancy B. It's got to be written as a single printed C or B. We've discovered some of the things about our periodic table today. More next time.